What is humanity's greatest need? What is humanity's greatest need? Well, many might say poverty, with uh, nearly half the people on the planet living on less than $2 a day. Or others might say our greatest need is for education, with nearly a billion people who can't read or write their own name. Or others might say preserving the environment with the threat of global warming. Or others still might say our greatest need is to fight crime. In this country, one new crime is committed about every six seconds. And we have the obvious need at the moment of getting over this pandemic and return to normal life. I think we'd agree that as we look at our world and our nation, there are massive needs. But what about personal needs? What would you say your greatest need is, my greatest need, personally? Well, in our passage this morning in Luke 5, we see a man here who has massive and obvious needs as he comes to Jesus. So, obviously, he comes paralysed. That is, he couldn't walk, and that almost certainly meant he wouldn't be able to work, and that he was desperately poor because of that. So his greatest need seems so obvious to us. If only he could get back on his feet again, he could work again, and he could earn money and get back to normal life. And so he comes to Jesus with this obvious and desperate need. But I think what's so striking about what Jesus says and how he deals with this man is that Jesus sees an even greater need that isn't so obvious, isn't so in your face. So look again at verse 20. These are the first words Jesus says to the man, and it's so striking that his first words are not get up and walk. He says, man, your sins are forgiven you. And in saying that, Jesus is showing us a really, really important thing this morning. He's showing us that our greatest need is not poverty, or sickness, or lack of education, or threat to the environment, or crime. Our greatest need is for forgiveness. Our greatest problem is sin. And so this brings us to the first heading this morning, that the first thing that this encounter impresses upon us, which is to hate sin with a passion. That's our first heading. Hate sin with a passion. I don't know about you, but I hate going to the doctor. It's probably a man thing, but I just hate being told there's something wrong with me. But actually, if there really was something wrong with me, seriously wrong, I wouldn't want the doctor to give me a pat on the back and a plaster. I'd want the doctor to discover the real problem and to do something about it. That's what a good doctor would do. And it's as if Jesus is being a good doctor to this man. And he'll be a good doctor to us too, if we'll let him. Because you see, this man's paralysis was not his deepest problem. It was actually more like a symptom a very bad symptom of that, but a symptom of the deeper problem, which was his sin, which was the deep root and cause of all his problems. So Jesus doesn't start with the symptom. He goes for the deeper cause. If he had just cured the man's paralysis without addressing his sin, then he would be a bit like a doctor just giving a plaster 
or a pill to someone with cancer. It might make them feel a bit better, but it's not actually dealing with the real problem. But Jesus sees that there's a deeper issue and he wants to deal with that. I want to say very clearly that the Bible never makes a direct link between sin and sickness. So it wasn't as if this man was more sinful than anyone else. It wasn't that his sickness, his paralysis, was directly because he had sinned in some way. But the Bible does make clear that sickness is an indirect problem of sin. In other words, if there were no sin in the world, no sin in our lives, then there would be no sickness, no poverty, no environmental problems, no crime. Because you see, sin is the real reason this world and our lives are in the mess they're in. Sin is the real reason so many people are dying of coronavirus. Sin is the reason relationships break down. Sin is the reason we all suffer and eventually die. And so sin is the reason this man is paralyzed. And that's why Jesus goes for his deepest problem first. I came across um, a really interesting article in the Times a few years back by um, Matthew Paris. You might have heard of him. He's well known um, for his atheism. And the headline of the article he wrote was this. As an atheist, I truly believe that Africa needs God. That's quite a striking headline, isn't it? As an atheist, I truly believe that Africa needs God. And the subtext read, missionaries, not aid money, are the solution to Africa's biggest problem. Let me read just a very short section of, to get at what he's saying. So he writes, now as a confirmed atheist, I've become convinced of the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa. Sharply distinct from the work of secular NGOs, government projects, and international aid efforts. These alone will not do. Education and training alone will not do. Now he, he says this, in Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts. It brings a spiritual transformation. The rebirth is real the change is good. Isn't that amazing from a secular atheist? Recognizing that our real problem is deep in our hearts. In other words, we need a change of heart. We need a spiritual transformation, a rebirth, as he puts it. And it's not that the efforts of doctors and aid agencies are useless, but they're not getting at the deeper heart problem. That's the, that's the issue. The real problem is human sin in the heart. And so missionaries are the answer in Africa because they show that this is the problem and they lead people to Jesus who can save and change the heart. So I think it's interesting if you turn back in Luke 4, do you remember there in verse 42, people are flocking to Jesus, seeking him, because he just healed so many, and obviously people are wanting to be healed and they're coming to him to be healed. But what's so striking is that he says in verse 43 of chapter 4, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. In 
In other words, he was sent for the purpose of preaching the good news. Now, of course, he did heal. He, he healed many, many people. But that wasn't his primary purpose. It wasn't primarily why he came. He primarily came to preach, to reveal people's need of forgiveness, and ultimately to die on a cross so that we could be forgiven. Do you see, if you think about it, to heal someone's sickness will make them better for a few more years. But to cure and heal someone's sin makes them well and fit for heaven in eternity. Uh, many of you will know the name Martin Lloyd-Jones, perhaps one of the greatest preachers of the last century. But he didn't begin his career as a preacher. He actually began his career as a doctor, a medical doctor. And he gave it up to become a preacher, having been on the verge of a brilliant career in Harley Street. And so people naturally asked him, why did you give up being a doctor, especially when you were going to be one of the high flying ones in the country? And he simply said and strikingly said, if you knew more about the work of a doctor, you would understand. Doctors spend most of their time rendering people fit to go back to their sin. I decided I would do no more of it. I want to heal souls. I want to heal souls. Healing the body is a good thing, don't get me wrong, but a much better thing is the healing of the heart, of the soul, the forgiveness of sins. So all this points us to a vital lesson this morning, to hate sin with a passion. Can you see, if sin is behind all of our problems, then we must hate it. In my work, I regularly come across people who are sick, sometimes really sick. I regularly come across people who are poor, sometimes desperately poor. I come across people who have lost loved ones, either through death or through a relationship breakdown, and they're broken hearted. Occasionally, I come across people who are trapped by evil in occult things or addictive behaviours. And whenever I cross, come across people like this, it really stirs me up. It really saddens me. I hate sickness. I hate poverty. I hate bereavement. I hate satanic influence. But Jesus' response to this paralyzed man is teaching me that I am to hate sin even more passionately because sin is behind all these things that I hate. Sin has messed up everything. But I want to make this personal, not just about a man 2,000 years ago, but for us today. Because if I'm to hate sin with a passion, then I must also hate my sin with a passion. Because my sin messes up my life and it messes up other people's lives. And our problem is that we don't naturally tend to feel that way about our sin. We might feel that way about other people's sin, especially if it hurts us. But when it comes to our own sin, we get rather blind, I think, to what it really is. We can even find it quite nice and part of us, we don't really want to get rid of it. It seems that the devil has spent the whole of human history trying to create a delicious gloss 
to sin rather than seeing it as something terrible that will destroy us. He makes us think it's something pleasurable that will give us satisfaction. But Jesus' words in verse 20 of chapter 5 show what a lie this is. Sin is worse than paralysis. So if a car is about to hit me and about to threaten my ability to walk, then I will do everything I can to avoid that car, wouldn't you? Well, I must be even more concerned about sin because it will literally crush me and destroy me. Hate sin with a passion. And that brings us to the second thing that this encounter presses upon us. To hate sin with a passion, but secondly, to love Jesus with a passion. To love Jesus with a passion. Because Jesus' words in verse 20 show that he can not only show us what our greatest need is, but he can actually do something about it. This is the great thing of this passage, this encounter. He says, man, your sins are forgiven you. Do you see that? He's not only saying, you've got a problem here, you've got sin in your heart. He's actually doing something about it. Your sins are forgiven you. And those are the most wonderful words we can ever hear Jesus say to us. Man, woman, boy, girl, your sins are forgiven you. They're wonderful words because sin, as we've seen, is so terrible. And we can't do anything about it ourselves. So if we've got um, a really serious illness like cancer, what wonderful words to hear your doctor say, you are healed, you are cured. But Jesus' words are even more wonderful because sin is even more terrible than sickness. So when he says you are forgiven, they're the most wonderful words we will ever hear. And I want us to see here that Jesus proves that he can forgive our sins. In verse 21, the religious leaders are incensed by Jesus' words. They know full well that only God can forgive someone's sins. And so Jesus is effectively claiming to be God by saying the man's sins are forgiven. And you see, the religious leaders are quite right that only God can forgive sins. But what they can't see is that Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God, standing right there before them. And Jesus, being God, reads their thoughts, knows their thoughts. And he provides compelling proof that he does indeed have the authority to forgive sins and is therefore the Son of God. So what's the proof? Verse 24, he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man, that's himself, has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise up, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home. Do you see that when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, there's no visible proof of that. It's something in the heart. And so what he's doing is providing a visible proof by healing the man to show that the invisible forgiveness has taken place. And so this is the wonderful truth that this encounter points to, that Jesus can forgive sins. Not just that Jesus can heal any disease on the planet, but even more wonderful and more powerful, Jesus can forgive our sins, all of us. Because sin is our greatest problem, we are to hate it with a passion, but because Jesus is the only saviour, 
We are to love him with a passion. In normal times on a Sunday, people will flock to all sorts of places. Football stadia are packed, shopping malls are full of people, and on a warm sunny day the beaches will be full of people as well. So why do people go to these places on a Sunday in particular? Well, surely it's because these are places where people feel their needs can be met in some way, where they can relax or have fun or get something they need. This is where people think their lives will become enriched and filled. And I'm not knocking any of those things. But what I think is so sad is that the one place most people don't even think of going to on a Sunday is to church. And that's sad because a good church is the place where we can meet with Jesus. The place where we can find our deepest needs being met. When we realise just how serious sin is in our lives, And when we realise that Jesus is the only one who has authority and power to deal with our sin, to forgive it, then we will love Jesus and we will want to meet with him. We'll want to be where he is and we'll want to make huge efforts to be there, to go and meet with him. So on that day in Capernaum all those years ago, that house where Jesus was, was absolutely packed. People had gathered, people had flocked to see Jesus, to meet with him. And the paralytic and his friends who brought him made a huge effort to get to see Jesus, to meet with him. As we read the story, they couldn't get into the house because of all the crowds of people. And so what do they do? They go up onto the roof, verse 19, and they start digging their way through the roof. This was serious demolition work. In those days, they had flat roofs. They were about two feet deep, made of mud and wood and tiles. And they just dug through the roof. Can you imagine that? They didn't think about the repair work afterwards. They didn't think about what would people think of us. They just were desperate to see Jesus. And you see, if we see something good, we will make such an effort to get it, won't we? To embrace it like a loving friendship or fulfilling job or a relaxing holiday. We'll make great efforts to embrace these good things. And you see, when we sense the goodness and the power of Jesus Christ, we will want to make every effort to be with him, to know his touch on our lives. At times of great revival, uh, we see people queuing at the church doors trying to get in, very similar to what we see here in this passage. And it's not always easy to get to church, is it? Particularly if you're elderly, or if you've got children, or if you're a stranger to Christian things. It's not always easy to get there, and even harder through these days of pandemic. But when we start to see who Jesus is, when we start to see his power, when we start to see his love, that he wants to touch us, he wants to bless us, he wants to deal with our deepest needs, then we will love him with a passion. And we'll want to be there, we'll want to make every effort to meet with Jesus Christ. And we also want to make an effort to bring others too, to bring our children, to bring our family, 
to bring our friends to meet with Jesus. Just like those four friends in the story, they made a huge effort to bring their friend, the paralytic, to get to Jesus. I think it's a wonderful thing when people flock to the Lord Jesus Christ to find that their greatest need for forgiveness is being met. So let's pray for ourselves. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit would convict us afresh, would show us our need for forgiveness, would give us a passion to turn away from sin, to hate it, to get rid of the lies that in some way it's pleasurable or good for us, to really turn from it. Let's pray that we would get a new love for Jesus Christ, to love him with a passion, to see his authority, to see his love, to want to hear his voice saying to us, your sins are forgiven you. And let's pray for God to work in our community. And let's do all we can to bring this good news to those who are in such need of forgiveness, like we are. Let's pray that the Lord would help people to see their need, their deepest need, and help people to see that only the Lord Jesus can meet that need of forgiveness. And let's pray that the Lord Jesus would be saying these wonderful words to all sorts of people in our community at this time. Man, woman, boy, girl, your sins are forgiven you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we want to thank and praise you for what we've seen this morning, what we've seen of your power and authority as the Son of God, but also what we've seen of your tenderness and love, of your concern, not just for our felt need, but of our deepest need that lies behind all of our felt needs. And we thank you, Lord, for providing visible proof of who you are and what you can do for us by healing the man as well as forgiving him. And so we pray for ourselves, Lord, that you would help us to turn away from sin and to turn to you, the one who can forgive us. We thank you in a moment. We'll remember your death where you took our sin and you died in our place. And I pray this morning that we would all know those wonderful words that our sins are forgiven, that we would know the joy of that, the freedom of that. And we want to pray not only for ourselves, but our community, Lord, this village and this area, indeed our nation, We pray that this would be a time this year when uh, many people would realise that our great need is for forgiveness and to be made right with you again. And we pray that indeed we might see people flocking to good churches up and down the country where they can meet with you and find the Saviour. In whose name we pray. Amen.